you a plugin that lives in Fiji and basically provides the big stitcher functionality, a part of it like the interest point based registration, but just to images that are open in Fiji. This is called the uh, descriptor based registration. At the same time, I will also try to show you how to macro record the whole thing and then basically run it from the command line or run it as a, as a macro. So that's actually the power of it, right? You can very quickly automate uh, these type of registrations. So uh, for this, I start uh, the plugins macro record panel, which sits here in the background and now records what I do. So I have a very simple example now. I just have two images that I want to align, but the same basically works for time series or yeah, more complicated sets, but it starts very simple and I think you can pretty straightforward extend it from there. So what we first need to do, and this is now for the macro recording, right, we do open those two files. So we open the crop one, which is here, and we open the cropped two. As you can see, this records the whole thing. So uh, these are just two images of one stack, so we do some kind of drift correction here, so it's very simple. In there's no new read to do this here, but still it's a reasonable example with reasonable signature noise to kind of show you how this practically works. So now we go to plugins, registration, descriptor-based registration. There's also the descriptor-based series registration down here that you can't see right now in the recorded window, but this uh, you would choose if one image is actually consistent of a time series that you want to stabilize. But for now we just register those two images, but it's basically the same parameters. You can, you can check this out yourself. Okay, it asks you which two images to register, one and two. Okay, this is the two that we're interested in. And now it asks us a few sets of parameters. So the first one is the brightness of detections, approximate size of detections, and type of detections. So for now we have to do this interactively because we don't really know it yet, right? What we, however, for macro recording, we later on have to run this whole thing again, then knowing the parameters that we actually want to put in. Also, okay, so we have to record this twice, but this is also how you will most likely have to do it in your case. So, suffix localization, you can leave to the mesocratic fit, is the right thing to do. Transformation model, that is a complicated question. If you just want to do drift correction, translation is right, then translation does uh, shifts. You can also do rigid, that also allows for rotation. You can do similarity, that also allows for isotropic scaling. You can do affine, that also allows for unisotropic scaling, meaning in a 2D case, X and Y can be scale differently, it allows for example shearing as well. Or you can do homography, which is basically panoramic uh, transformation model that allows that, that enables that parallel lines don't stay parallel. So this is for example if you think of perspectives, this is when you have two images, for example, with a camera that you took a picture from two different orientations, that's what you would need here. In this case you think it's very simple, it's only a translation, it's just a movement that we want to correct. If you do any transformation model of a higher order, you might want to regularize it. For example, I'm saying you want to do affine, but I want to regularize it with a rigid, saying yes, you can scale, but not too much. But uh, I think this is uh, something uh, you can explore in a later stage. Please feel free to send me emails or comment, and I will uh, explain this more. So, it asks if the images are pre-aligned, yes or no. If they are pre-aligned, it only does the translation invariant meshing. That means that only this is faster and more robust, but the rotation can be up to 5 degrees. If it's, the images are rotated to each other more than that, it doesn't work. In this case, it is approximately aligned, but if you choose not aligned, or you can also provide the transformation if you know it. Okay, the next three here are uh, parameters for the meshing itself. The number of neighbors you hardly want to change. The redundancy you might want to change. You might remember this from a video that I uh, before um, Recorded for big stitches is exactly the same matching paradigm. Redundancy, if you don't find enough matches, you can increase this. Uh, it basically just tries to find more features in between those two uh, things that are in common by doing a more redundant, a more thorough search. However, it might find wrong ones and it might find, uh, it might take very long. However, the wrong ones should be filtered out in the Ransack step anyways, so usually you can increase this to a certain amount, two or maximally three, maybe even four, depends on how many points you have, to basically just find uh, some correspondences. The significance defines uh, how to look for corresponding points. So it tries to find corresponding constellations of points. Uh, and it always finds the best and the second best one. And the significance basically says for everyone to be considered to be a post, uh, corresponding point, how much better does it have to be than the second best one? If you choose one, 
That means it will just take for every point whatever looks best. Usually you want it at least to be twice as good, so you can filter kind of a lot of potentially wrong matches. But again, this depends on what you want to align. Usually two is a very sensible uh, uh, parameter. The allowed error for Ransack is, as I said, uh, we do uh, outlier filtering. That means it finds corresponding points and it will visualize these corresponding points later. Um, and if it matches them relative together, there's still a remaining error, no matter which transformation model you use. And this defines how big this remaining error is allowed to be. Five is a reasonable alignment. If you're not sure, you might want to have it one pixel, you might want to have it 50. It really depends on image. So five is usually a reasonable uh, uh, parameter. So we want to create overlaid images. In this case, it depends on what you want. And we want to add the point drawers that actually shows us the features that were found. So that's it, we press OK, and now we'll go to the interactive mode where we actually find the points. So as you can see here, here's a preview window that shows us what would be found in this uh, image right now. So yeah, it might be a little bit too small, so I would make it a bit bigger like this, maybe a little bit more like this. That, that looks very reasonable, find the points that it found. The size of this doesn't matter, it's really just if you have a very large image, it can't kind of compute this on the fly, so it's really just a preview window, it doesn't mean anything apart from that. So, okay, if we do this now in both of them, run an alignment and then potentially fuse the image if it found it. Okay, let's do this. And this was very quick. It found those corresponding points. The lock window also tells you a bit more about uh, an error of one pixel, 1.1, that's very good. 28 found out of 32. So the outlier filtering with Ransack found four of the 32 that it thought would be corresponding points to not agree on a state transformation model, and these are all the points that found in common. With that, it fused those two uh, uh, images together. If you go to Image Color Channels tool and look at this with grayscale, you can see that the alignment is pretty reasonable. And this is basically just a z-stack, so interestingly, it actually had to do a little alignment 0.2. 1.6 pixels in X and 0.14 pixels in Y. So, of course, for your images, this might be much bigger, but this, I thought, is just a simple image to show you the basic principle of this. Okay, now we can close everything, and the actual alignment is done, right? You have your fused image, that's it. But as I said, we want to automate this. So let's have a look at what the macro recorder recorded. It recorded something here that says interactive. And interactive is not very useful for us, because then if you actually want to automate it, it will pop up this window where you actually choose this. So we basically remove everything here. Zack. We only want the open. We unselect everything, which is uh, Command Shift A and Command Shift A on this. Yeah, Fiji's complaining here. Command Shift A. So also this we do not want to record. So now we record the same thing again, but now we know the parameters. So we go again to the registration, the script of a series registration. Same images, yes. And now we set this here to advanced. The size we set to advanced. And the type of detections we set to maxima only. This is what we selected. So we didn't look for minima. I didn't go into this. This is another uh, discussion. But usually you want to look for intensity maxima, not intensity minima. It really depends on. OK, so now it will ask us for these parameters. Luckily, it remembers now the ones that were actually um, put in in our interactive mode before. So we run it, same thing happens, same points are there. But now it recorded it in a way that we can actually automate this. And that's cool, right? So now we can load the images and just do whatever we want. So usually you, I guess, want to save this result. So what we also wanted, would like to, um, to record is a saving of the output. So we go to File, Save as TIFF, and we save this in the same directory. Click Save. Okay, what is a bit problematic here, if we now want to record this, we have still the issue that the images will be named all the time differently, which makes the saving very, very complicated. Could potentially make the saving complicated. And you every time have to adjust this command as well. So this is maybe okay. If you know what the images are, you just put and make it in a variable. So let's do that for now. The other option would be to actually rename the images in the beginning to as image A, image B, and then you save it accordingly. 
but yeah. And the last thing we want to do is file close all, like, and then all the things are done. So now we create this macro. Here we are. So uh, we would make a directory. So you could, for example, auto create this file then using Python, right? You could just create this file and then basically run it on whatever files you want. So we have uh, file one is then this one. File two is this one. And now we open dear plus file one. We open dear plus file two. We don't have to select a window. Now we have to look in here where the file names here. First image is this. So we replace this with file one. And the second image is here. And we replace this with file two. And we save as TIFF, so this is basically diffused. And then we have file one. And we have file two. So that's it. That should now run automatically. So let's see if that works. So we look in the folder. I remove this again. So we run this. We have a little error. Yeah, and now we run into exactly these problems that I mentioned before. So it removed the TIFF here from the Sorry, now I'm confused. What happened? Sorry, what does it say? Ah, sorry. We do not run into any trouble. We simply have to close the bracket. So this is very interactive programming, right? So this is what happens all the time. Now we run it, actually worked, fantastic. Here it is can open it, zack, and the aligned, uh, aligned uh, images there. So, that's it. We save our macro to the same. We call this, for example, align.imagej macro. This is, this is a very simple text file that you can, for example, open with a text editor. And we have exactly the same thing in there, right? So you could simply adjust this, recreate this, and then you know exactly which kind of file will be created, and you can just load this later. You could also save this under a different file name, right? You don't even have to save it under this file.